So we want to turn the page here to a very important issue here domestically, and that is in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where the teachers are on strike. I believe this is the second week of the strike, but we'll find out if I'm wrong about that. Very happy to be joined by Kristen Melby, who is a teacher in Minneapolis, been with the Minneapolis Public Schools for 15 years, an elementary environmental educator. Kristen, thank you so much for being with us here on the Freedom Side. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, we we're are. Very we're right. We're in week two. We're in week two. Okay, good. I'm glad I was right about that. Uh, trying to follow it as closely as possible. Uh, we're honored to have you here. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, I've seen you guys singing Purple Rain. You've had a lot of big demonstrations. But for those who haven't seen, give us the context of, of why you all uh, uh, went out to the picket line. Yeah, so we've been in negotiations for 13 months, and the district has maintained that the status quo is fine for students and staff, and we overwhelmingly say no. You know, we had a historic strike vote. 97% of teachers voted to go on strike. 98% of ESPs, which are our support staff in our buildings that keep our buildings running, voted to go on strike. So no one here is going to settle for the status quo. Um, I think after the pandemic, we saw that schools are essential. If people didn't know that before, they should know that now. Um, and the district continues to refuse to let us even come to the table to be part of decision making. And I see these pictures right now of the strike band. Like, I think you see on the streets right now joy in our resistance because there's been so much resistance repression for so long that people are feeling just like this is such a righteous struggle and we are finding joy in it even in in the fact that this is difficult you know it's difficult to be away from our students after all these months through the pandemic but we we know that it's it's the right work to do right now you know i'm glad you said that because it really does feel like we're at a critically important inflection point we talk about public education I mean, we've seen so many teachers you know have have been leaving the profession because it's just so difficult with all these challenges and, and i'm curious your thoughts about this i mean it feels like if there was ever a time it's probably always a time for this that if we don't invest in public education now the impacts of this are going to be catastrophic on our our young people over the next you know decade or so yeah, I would say, you know, the comparison to sort of our healthcare system, right? Like if we didn't figure that out during a pandemic that we need to invest because we all do better when we're all doing better, that then what what will it take, right? Um, you know, I, I feel like we had the opportunity in Minneapolis to do things right when we came back from our distance learning. We could have kept our class sizes small to meet the mental health challenges of students. We could have kept them small and brought in more support staff to make sure that those students who struggled with learning from different spaces got, the need, got their needs met. And we didn't do that. And part of why we didn't do that is because the imbalance of power between the district and educators and communities is completely out of whack, right? We were never brought into the conversations of how and when and in what nuanced ways to, to bring students back into buildings and what kind of supports they needed. The community wasn't in, invited into that and we weren't invited into that. And so mistake after mistake after mistake was made. And so you see not only educators leaving but students leaving. And if educators and families were at the table, I think we would have had a really different outcome. Um, I'm so a parent. I have an eight-year-old in the district as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> and just want to no, say no, like, no, so no, I please, live, please. I live that experience from both, both angles. Right. Um, and I am committed to public education, not only for my own child, but, but for everyone's children and the district has to be forced to do better. It's Sorry, interesting, actually, an interesting, no, 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 please. It's an interesting dynamic, actually, because so often the narrative that's promoted, particularly in the mainstream press, and then, of course, by the anti-union types is teachers and parents are opposed to each other. Um, so we often do forget a lot of teachers actually are parents. But that said, can you tell us a little bit about what the strikers are demanding? What are some of the basic demands um, that you're asking for? Yeah, so we're kind of fighting under a banner of safe and stable schools. And, and what that means is we need small, smaller class sizes. So we need caps. You know, we can, the district can say, okay, sure, we'll give you small caps 
class sizes. But unless we get something in the contract that says this is the cap, we know that that can turn like in some rooms like 45, you know, there's first grade classrooms with 35 students. And these are first graders who maybe only stepped in the building for the first time this year, right? They might've spent their entire kindergarten in like learning online. Um, so in addition to smaller class sizes, we're asking for mental health supports. Right now, the ratio to um, social workers to students is one to a thousand. Um, you can imagine how um, effective that is. So we want like ratios that more reflect the needs of what our students have um, we want a competitive and livable wage for our education support professionals. Most folks are earning about $24,000 a year, um, which means wow. many of them are working two and three jobs, right? Aren't able to make, make rent. Um, and these are the, some of the folks that do, I would say, the hardest work in our buildings, right? They're the they're the support staff who work with children with special needs, right? There are bilingual um, assistants who help interpret for families who speak multiple languages, right? And they're also the ones who were put back into buildings first before anyone was vaccinated and to work with kids, right? So these folks have historically and continue to dedicate themselves to the well-being of kids and are not treated with respect from the district or compensated in a way that they eat, can even like live off of. Um, yeah. So, wow. I mean, I feel like our demands, and I, I just feel like it's really important to say like, we're not asking for anything that's outrageous, right? Like we're asking for class sizes that are manageable, mental health for students and a living and dignified like working conditions for, for the people who work with kids. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's such an important point because it's sort of like, you know, if you stop any anyone on the street, probably even a lot of these politicians and just ask them, oh, should we have small class sizes? Yes. Should we support students with mental health? Yes. Like the type of things that almost everyone recognizes has to happen if we're going to have good public schools, which which brings me to my next question, because, you know, I saw an amazing video of, of two of your officers giving an update on what was going on. But the thing that caught me, I sent it to a lot of my teacher friends is as the video goes on. The number of people honking uh, in support of the picket line just as like it becomes more and more prominent, and it felt like every car by the end. So, what kind of support are you all seeing from the the community there in Minneapolis? Yeah, it's 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 on fire. I mean, the love is everywhere. You know, every morning we're at our sites, um, and people are dropping us off more food and more donations than we even know what to do with. Um, people are honking, you know, I was out, I live 10 blocks from where I work. And so I took my son on a bike ride after one of the pickets and I had three families who stopped me and they said, we will keep our kids home as long as it takes to get what students and staff deserve. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like it is unbelievable the level of support and Minneapolis has been through a lot, like for the last couple of years, you know, like it is a, it is a city that has had to wrestle and continues to wrestle with a lot of deep issues around racial justice, around police violence. And, you know, in addition to all the inequities that were exacerbated by the pandemic, right? And and in that, you see mutual aid, like systems set up all over the place and folks are coming out and saying like, you know, we are gonna do whatever it takes to hold the line, like whatever it takes. Um, and families and community members are, are helping us do that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly been fantastic to see. I mean, you've had a number of huge marches. I, I mean, I, I just, I mean, just massive marches through downtown Minneapolis. So, if you could just talk a little bit about sort of the the broader. I mean, you talk about this joy and resistance, but the broader sort of community that seems to be being created uh, out there on the line and out there in the streets, because it really does seem powerful, even seeing it through a screen. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, all this creativity that has been like, I don't know, repressed or <laughs> held down by by these systems is really just like exploded into into the streets. And we have children and we have high school students playing in our strike band. And we have St. Paul educators who are coming across the river and they are taking days off work to come and support us and let us know that our fight is their fight. 
Um, and I just think every single day we're, we're seeing more of that. Um, people are seeing it in the streets. And, and I think that's like what, you know, like we're channeling that rage into this expression of like joyous resistance and that like you can't contain that, you know, so the district is starting like we're seeing cracks in our negotiations. We've had some folks step down even in the last 24 hours, which shows that like they they get the power out there on the streets mm -hmm. um, and, and each day like, you know. It didn't matter last week. It was negative 10 and it was snowing um, in Minnesota and it didn't it didn't affect the numbers on our lines. You know, people were still out there and, you know, solid mm -hmm. in, in what we're doing. I'm, I'm curious, like, what can people do to follow the strike? Where can they support it if they want to support it or to just follow along and see how things are going? Yeah, so we have, so MFT has a Facebook page and a website, but we've also created um, another webpage called safeandstableschools.org, where you can find the most up-to-date information on there. Um, you know, and we will take all short sorts of signs of solidarity, signs like reaching out and also like financial support is, is also key, you know, because lots of our members were struggling before we went on strike, right? And so now it's, it's day eight. Um, of of no work. And so any sort of support that can come in, we will make sure it gets to the folks that need it. Mm -hmm. Well, Kristen, we really appreciate you being willing to come on. Uh, just a fantastic fight that you all are waging out there for students in Minneapolis. And I think it's a great example for people all around the country. So I know you got a lot going on, but thanks so much for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thank you so much. We're heading back to the streets at four o'clock tonight. So right on.